Thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, evening, everybody. My name is Charlie Sanabria. I am uh, a postdoc at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And back when I was a, a graduate student, I was uh, studying the optimization of niobium 3 conductors, or more specifically, the, the RRP conductors. And today I'll be um, talking about a small modification I would like to do on the uh, new RRP heat treatment, uh, especially if you're going from wires to cables. And now, I thought it would be appropriate to start by um, talking about what the new RRP heat treatment is. Um, so here's the standard heat treatment uh, of RRP, unchanged for over a decade. And uh, when I was studying this back when I was a student, I, I asked, oh, um, you know, I, I think I know what happens at 665. You're forming negative 310, but what happens at 210 and what happens at 400? And I was told, you're mixing tin and you're mixing ADA. And I said, oh, okay, that's cool. Uh, let me read a little bit about it. I started reading about it, and I started noticing a lot of inconsistencies in the, in the literature uh, about its purpose, about its efficiency, about even whether it's, uh, it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and after a few experiments uh, and, and a lot of reading, I uh, realized that uh, there's this moment in the heat treatment where the, 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 this magical face now site, the ternary face that uh, brings order to the whole sub-element. This is a, a micrograph of a sub-element where you see this now site face for, uh, arranges itself in the shape of a, a, a ring. And it acts as a uh, one-way membrane that only allows the copper in, but it doesn't allow the tin out. And uh, this happens roughly around the 400 degrees Celsius a step. Uh, so, um, after a few experiments of optimization of this step, we realized we had to, it, it, was more, it was more efficient if we go lower in temperature and much longer in time. And we reached uh, uh, this, this, what we call now the now side control heat treatment that has a very specific purpose of um, controlling the, or allowing the copper through while holding the tin back. And at the same time, we're trying to control the growth of nowside because eventually nowside is not so um, uh, is, is, a is slightly detrimental to the to the wires, but it has a, a, a pretty good uh, function as far as this goes. The results were recently published. We were very happy about them. Uh, you can see a small step closer to the FCC target. I'm looking forward to here in the next couple of talks. Uh, they will probably leave this in the dust, but we were very happy about this. Um, and every time I presented this, people would say, what happened with this step? What happened to the 210 step? Or don't you know what happens when you skip the 210 step? And I, my claim at the time, I said, well, I've heat treated hundreds of round wires, and it doesn't seem to have a, an effect. So why do it? And before I answer that question, let me emphasize on that. There is no effect in round wires not kinetically and not electromagnetically. Looking at the kinetics of this, here's a sub-element, unreacted sub-element. You can see the tin core in the center with a little bit of copper around it, then the filamentary area and the navium barrier on the outside. Once you go through the first step, it looks a little bit like this. Some diffusion happened. Uh, you still have a lot of tin left behind, but you formed some of this copper tin faces around the core. 48 hours, you still have some tin, okay. Uh, then if you move to the last, uh, hour of the second step, step now site kicks in, it brings order to the entire structure, looks uh, pretty good, but then I realized that, and of course this is, is, is copper uh, control, and this is very useful, this is a useful step. We've proven that uh, it, it, uh, it does a series of, of, of things. It, it decreases the tin content inside the core, which in turn reduces the fraction of eta, and because eta melts at 408 degrees Celsius, uh, it will eventually, this, uh, this process reduces the liquid uh, that will be produced later on. But what I notice is that when I skip the 210 step, we reach the exact same point. The order was brought back to the sub-element and all, all that chaos that happened during the 210 step is just, uh, it goes back to, to, to that. So that's kinetically, but also electromagnetically, and I want to show the data here, but we tested hundreds of, of samples uh, and, well, yeah, actually, electromagnetically, not hundreds, but uh, tens of samples across minimum, uh, multiple billets. 
and they show neg negligible differences between triple R uh, and I IC. So again, why are we doing it? Um, well, if you talk to uh, people around this room, they'll probably tell you, well, they, the wires most likely will leak tin out. Uh, I've taken pictures of, of these uh, situations myself. Um, but then again, I wanted to go back in the literature trying to find as much as I could, as much information as I could. There was very little uh, information about tin bursts in the literature. Uh, they were briefly mentioned in the RRP patent. If these uh, steps are omitted, the wires are subject to tin bursting. Uh, another person said the heat treatment must be adequate in preventing the tin leaks, which are an issue when you have a lot of tin. Um, and uh, there was another paper that I sort of agree, agreed with me that these, these tin leakages are not a problem in virgin strands. However, that's not true for magnets or cables. And of course, again, anecdotes of those. Any, any person that has made a, um, an evidently tin magnet uh, has heard these stories. Uh, so I, I'm not a fan of anecdotes. I like evidence. I went ahead and, and uh, now that I'm at LBL, I could go and dig into the, wire, uh, the cable archive and dig a bunch of old cables uh, made with RP wires, even old, uh, the, the predecessor technology of RP, MJR, and multiple different, uh, different parameters for these cables. Took about three, meter, three, sorry, three feet of cable, put them in the oven, uh, and ramped them up as fast as I could uh, just to push it, just to see what the worst case scenario is. Uh, roughly 100 degrees C per hour, uh, and uh, when I took the cables out, I looked at them, took pictures of them. Uh, took, you, what you're seeing here is the edge of the cable, um, which is probably the weakest link as far as tin bursting goes. And they looked okay, except for this guy. Uh, this uh, cable was fabricated with an RRP wire that has a low, low copper spacing between the subelements, so probably the deformation was a little more uh, uh, dramatic uh, inside the wires. And um, I, I also got one little tin burst bubble uh, for a cable that was made with uh, high lumi conductors, so, so it is an issue, uh, even in modern RRP wires. So just for the sake of um, curiosity, we went and looked at the cross-section of this, although not much to learn from this, so other than this is pretty dramatic. A lot of tin came out, uh, lots of uh, deformation, and um, uh, you can see probably the pinching point right there where the subelement uh, got too close to the copper jacket and uh, poke a hole, poked a hole through it. So let's go back to the prevention mechanism. Again, not much mentioned in the literature, but the claim is that you're forming this protective copper tin layer around the tin core to prevent that from uh, spewing out tin. So I took some pictures at uh, different stages. At zero hours, just at the beginning when you first get to 210, uh, you, you're already started forming this copper tin layer around it. At 24 hours, you have a thicker layer, of course. Now, this wire uh, is a modern RP wire, so it has a subelement size of a uh, diameter of around 50 microns. So, and right here, the, that thickness is roughly 5 microns. And after 48 hours, they look exactly the same. So right off the bat, we could take out 24 hours and just do the first 24, and we're OK, right? So but I said, well, how, how much lower can we go? I looked at some diffusion couple experiments on, uh, in the literature and found that, in fact, a 5 micron layer, like the one you see here on the right-hand side, can be grown in less than 10 hours, or roughly 10 hours, by those diffusion couple experiments. So. I said, all right, let's look at these cables that previously produce all, the, uh, all this tin. Um, and just a brief reminder of what the parameters are. This one is made with a modern RRP wire with 55 microns in size. Um, remember this. There's a limit of the thickness here because you only have so much copper. After it, the, the boundary reaches the, the, the naive filaments, the, the diffusion stops. This other one, however, has a much larger subelement, 80 microns, so you could grow a, th a thicker copper tin layer. But I, I, I risked it. I went as, as little conservative as I could. I did uh, four hours only at 210 and looked at what had grown up to that point, roughly 4.5 4 microns in thickness, this copper tin layer. This is what a, a very uh, damaged subelement looks like. And so I said, OK, what happens if I now take that and take it all the way up past the melting point of tin. Not much, 
uh, no tin burst observed in either of the cables. I would have a picture there. It would be just another cable just like the other ones. So that's it. So simple, uh, <laughs> simple experiment, simple results. Here are my conclusions. Uh, when using aggressive ramp race, even modern RMP uh, cabled wires can develop tin bursts. OK. Now, the copper tin protective layer around the tin core um, has a thickness limitation which depends on the subelement size. So we could do a study of uh, how big is the subelement and what's the optimum time for that uh, subelement to exhaust all the copper available. Um, however, that's not necessary because we've also shown that even cables that have been heavily deformed, all you need is about a thick, so five micron thick copper tin layer to prevent this tin burst. And um, so this is the slight rec recommendation to the heat treatment that, that uh, came out of the publication this year. Uh, instead of completely skipping it, if you're cabling or you have uh, any suspicion that the wire might have gotten damaged, uh, yeah, we can stop uh, at 210 for uh, just also to be a little conservative. You don't want to, maybe not the four hours that I did, but why not stop for 10? Um, just bear in mind that uh, we don't need the 48 hours. Uh, it's OK if you want to do them. Uh, and I, I have a few minutes I would like to address that question, because I've gotten this question many times when I presented these results. Uh, some Various people have come to me and said something to the extent of, why are you pushing so hard to get rid of these 48 hours when you yourself have proven that it doesn't hurt to do them? And uh, it doesn't hurt to do them it sounds to me like we're just afraid of the consequences of that change. And I, I think um, being afraid of, of something is not the approach that a scientist should ever take. We should, you know, uh, this is what science does. It, it provides evidence. It gives us the, the power to make changes. And changes, as small as they are, they're changes towards progress and better understanding. So uh, that's why I'm pushing so hard to, to get rid of those. 48 hours and you do it as efficiently as I could, even though I added 400 hours after that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, but that's my opinion. So nonetheless, I would like to acknowledge all the persons that were involved in the making of these cables and everyone that has uh, helped me uh, on, on, on these studies that have gone for over two or th over three years now. Um, but uh, it will continue as I look, uh, as you can see here, my next step is looking at the optimization of the last stage of this heat treatment. And we're working on it. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Charlie. There is time for a question. Yes. I'd like to give you another reason for the 210. I recognize uh, the Eric Gregory, who really worked with the rod and tube well before Oxford got involved. Yeah. And we, 2002, 2005, I asked him, why this 210 step? And he basically said that the days that uh, people like were making uh, the magnets, as far as they're using S-class layer in between the Rutherford cable for winding, and really the degassing of the binder that was really the issue, because they would well up the whole coil, so you had to gradually burn off that carbon that was the binder. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's still a problem because the S-class lower binder count has came out over yeah. here. But I've checked with Ron Scanlon and Dan Dietrich to see if any of that makes sense to them yeah. in that early 2000 period when Rod and Tube was actually developed. And that yeah. schedule was set up long before RRP came into existence. Oh. This this one I haven't heard. Thanks for the for the tip. I, I searched through the literature and I found all kinds of stories. Uh, this one I haven't heard. Those that know Eric Gregory, we, as far as Eric's memory, sometimes was challenged as far as remembering how things were done <laughs> years ago. Or okay, awesome. Thank you. Yes. Further to uh, Mike Tomczyk's comment. 210 also, we uh, believe and experience about the stress relief effect. So not even routine, um, uh, to do the study from the Dan Dietrich, the dilatometry study, around the 210 and between 200 and 210, it actually tracks. So if you wind the not even coil uh, without giving any um, uh, consideration of the stress relief, it will experience a tremendous tension during that 
uh, time and get any wire. So, uh, Did you say no Open 310 contract? Yeah, open but at that point, there's no Open 310. There's all copper tin and, and niobium. Right. No, the, what I'm talking about is the purpose of the 210 step. Right, but this step is all before any Navin 310 is formed. So why would why would the properties of Navin 310 affect this step if there's no Navin 310? Okay, but when it's going it through the content step, it actually contracts, it's trying to contract that, that temperature. What does? What contracts? The wire, the wire itself. Ah, oh, okay. Yes. I, I thought you were talking about specifically the, the, the material of Navin 310. Okay. Uh, okay. Oh, oh so I see. We actually had an uh, issue. Uh, if we didn't hold the 210 wire flexibility and it was damaged. So uh, use either um, adjustable spool mm -hmm. that you could uh, lose on. Uh, yeah. So uh, warning of the binder in the test class is one thing, but also stress for Right. So, so this is this is precisely my point. Uh, it, are we going to be afraid of all these stories for decades to come, or should we just challenge them and and find out uh, if 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 this is true? Because I don't I don't want to uh, just live of some old story that that, that someone told me. Uh, and and it, I understand experience is very valuable, but but I haven't seen any of this. Uh, I'm just I, I want all, all of us to challenge our our our. Uh, it's, been, it's been on for long. Yeah. Very last question. Yeah. Also about this uh, ten-hour uh, step, uh, is it enough so that uh, because when we react to large coils, we need the the, the temperature is uh, homogeneous in the, into the the coil at every point. Uh, this. Uh, a layer, uh, I mean, a uh, protecting layer is forming everywhere. In the mm -hmm. coast. So is, it, is it enough this 10 hours? Or? Well, uh, at, at least for the cables that I just, uh, that are reacted here, it, it, they grew only, only a 4.5 micron thick layer, uh, which only took four hours. So uh, I guess depending on the mass of your magnet, you can be conservative and do, do 20 hours or so. But it, it's just that's another thing that sort of bothered me a little bit. 48 hours. Two days and two nights. That's that sounds. Uh, that kinetics don't obey how how fast the Earth turns. <laughs> we should just do obey kinetics. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you. We are running out of time, so that's it. Try again. All right. Thank you.